Welcome to Quaver Television, where we take you on a deep dive into the mind of an old hip-hop head. Today, we're exploring the profound impact of one of rap's most influential figures, Ice Cube. I was watching a reel featuring Cube, where he said he is not a gatekeeper, I was flabbergasted, thinking about, what if Cube never existed, how many people would also not exist in the world of rap, comedy, and acting. So, I have explored the NWA family tree so what I would find, this tree is nowhere near complete, but just listen to some of the names that could not have joined the game with no cube. I'm not dissing, I would never diss a legend, but think about it cube you may not think you are a gatekeeper, but you have had the keys in your pocket for a long time. Join me as we unravel the legacy of a true gatekeeper who reshaped the industry and redefined the genre. Get ready to journey through the history and insights that have shaped hip-hop as we know it. Let's get started. To understand the monumental impact of NWA and its far-reaching influence on hip-hop, film, comedy, and culture, we have to start at the beginning, not with, straight out of Compton, but with the origins of the group itself. NWA wasn't just born out of a single moment, it was the result of a convergence of talents, circumstances, and cultural forces that would soon explode into something much larger than any of its members could have imagined. NWA, which stands for Niggas with Attitudes, came together in the mid-1980s, during a time when the music industry and the world were just beginning to understand the power of hip-hop as a voice for the voiceless. The group's core members, Ice Cube, O'Shea Jackson, Dr. Dre, Andre Young, Eazy E, Eric Wright, DJ Yella, Antoine Caraby, and MC Ren, Lorenzo Patterson, were young men from Compton, California, a place synonymous with the struggles of urban America. But before the world knew them as NWA, they were just a group of ambitious artists trying to find their way in a rapidly evolving music scene. The story of NWA's formation is rooted in the collaboration between Eazy E and Dr. Dre. Eazy E, a former drug dealer, had a vision of starting his own record label, Ruthless Records, and Dre, who had been making waves as a turntablist and producer with the world class Wrecking Crew, was looking to expand his horizons beyond the electro funk sound that was popular at the time. The two connected through mutual shows and began working together, laying down tracks that would eventually define the West Coast sound. Ice Cube, who was still in high school, was writing rhymes that captured the gritty reality of life in Compton. His raw, unfiltered lyrics caught the attention of Dre and Easy, and soon, he was brought into the fold. DJ Yella, Dre's close friend and collaborator from the world-class Wrecking Crew, and MC Ren, another Compton native with a knack for storytelling, rounded out the group. But NWA didn't burst onto the scene with, straight out of Compton. Their first release was, NWA and the Posse, in 1987, a compilation album that featured the early lineup of the group along with other artists from the local scene. This album gave the world its first taste of what NWA was capable of, but it was only the beginning. Tracks like, Boys and the Hood, hinted at the group's potential, with Eazy es distinctive voice and Cube's hard-hitting lyrics standing out even in these early days. NWA and the Posse, wasn't a commercial juggernaut, but it laid the groundwork for what was to come. It introduced the group's brash, unapologetic style and established Ruthless Records as a label that wasn't afraid to push boundaries. The album also marked the beginning of NWA's relationship with Arabian Prince, Kim Nasal, an early member whose influence on the group's sound in their formative years is often overlooked. Arabian Prince's electro-funk background brought a unique element to NWA's early music, blending with Dre's style to create something new and exciting. While Arabian Prince would eventually part ways with NWA before the release of, Straight Outta Compton, his contribution to the group's early sound is a crucial part of their story. His departure allowed the group to solidify its core lineup, focusing on the raw, aggressive style that would define their later work. As NWA began to gain momentum, the individual members started to take on more defined roles within the group. Easy e became the face of the group, using his streetwise persona to connect with fans. Ice Cube emerged as the primary lyricist, his powerful storytelling abilities setting the tone for the group's music. Dr. Dre, the mastermind behind the beats, was developing a production style that would soon revolutionize hip-hop. DJ Yella provided the backbone of their sound, his skills as a DJ and producer helping to craft the group's signature style. MC Ren's contributions as a lyricist and performer rounded out the group, adding depth to their narratives of life in Compton. This early period in NWA's history is essential for understanding the group's later success. It was a time of experimentation, collaboration, and growth. The group was honing its craft, 
developing the sound and style that would soon take the world by storm. But this is just the beginning. Let's delve into the making of Straight Outta Compton, the album that would change everything and establish NWA as one of the most influential groups in music history. The album that changed everything by 1988, NWA was ready to unleash their fully developed sound on the world. What emerged was Straight Outta Compton, an album that would redefine not just West Coast hip hop but the entire genre. The album wasn't just music, it was a raw, unapologetic statement about life in Compton, a place most Americans knew little about. But once they heard, straight out of Compton, they couldn't ignore it. The album kicked off with the title track, Straight Out of Compton, a sonic blast that introduced the world to NWA's defiant, in your face style. Ice Cube's opening verse, Straight Out of Compton, crazy motherfucker named Ice Cube, from the gang called Niggas with Attitudes, immediately set the tone. This was music that wasn't asking for permission or forgiveness. It was a declaration of identity and a searing indictment of the systemic racism and violence that plagued the inner city. Tracks like, Fuck the Police, weren't just provocative, they were revolutionary. The song captured the frustration and anger felt by a generation of young black men who were constantly harassed and brutalized by law enforcement. The track's impact was so profound that it even caught the attention of the FBI who sent a warning letter to the group's label, Ruthless Records. But instead of backing down, NWA doubled down, using the controversy to further cement their status as voices of rebellion. Dr. Dre's production on, Straight Outta Compton, was another revelation. He blended funk samples with hard-hitting beats, creating a sound that was both innovative and unmistakably West Coast. Dre's influence on the album cannot be overstated, he was crafting a sonic blueprint that would become the foundation for G-Funk, a subgenre that would dominate hip-hop in the early 1990s. Ice Cube's lyrics throughout the album were as sharp as they were incendiary. His ability to tell stories of street life with vivid detail and biting social commentary made him one of the most respected lyricists in hip-hop. Songs like, Gangsta Gangsta, and, Express Yourself, showcased Cube's range, he could go from describing the harsh realities of gang life to advocating for free expression in the face of censorship. MC Ren, often the underappreciated member of the group, delivered some of the album's most memorable verses. His dark, gritty style complemented Cube's more narrative-driven approach, adding a layer of menace to the group's overall sound. Tracks like, If It Ain't Rough, highlighted Ren's skills as a solo performer, proving that NWA was a group with no weak links. Easy e with his high-pitched, almost cartoonish voice, brought an element of charisma and unpredictability to the album. His verses on songs like, Eight Ball, and Dope Man, became iconic, cementing his status as one of the most recognizable MCs in hip-hop. Easy's persona as the godfather of gangster rap was born out of these tracks, and it's a role he would play to perfection for the rest of his career. Straight Outta Compton wasn't just a commercial success, it was a cultural phenomenon. The album went on to sell millions of copies and has since been certified triple platinum. But more importantly, it opened the doors for West Coast hip-hop, which had long been overshadowed by its East Coast counterpart. The success of Straight Outta Compton proved that there was a massive audience for stories from the streets of Los Angeles, and it paved the way for countless artists who would follow in NWA's footsteps. The album also set the stage for the group's inevitable split. Tensions between the members, particularly between Ice Cube and Eazy-E, began to rise as the group's fame grew. Cube felt that he wasn't being fairly compensated for his contributions, and after the release of Straight Outta Compton, he decided to leave the group and pursue a solo career. This decision would not only change the course of Cube's life but also set off a chain of events that would lead to some of the most famous beefs in hip-hop history. The impact of Straight Outta Compton cannot be overstated. It's an album that didn't just change music, it changed culture. NWA had put the world on notice, and there was no turning back. Now that we've covered the album that launched NWA into the stratosphere, it's time to delve into the aftermath. Ice Cube's departure from NWA in 1989 marked a pivotal moment not only in his career but in the history of hip-hop. Dissatisfied with his financial situation and feeling underappreciated by the group's management, particularly by Eazy-E and Jerry Heller, Cube made the bold decision to walk away from NWA at the height of their popularity. This move was seen as risky, but it turned out to be the beginning of an even more influential chapter in his career. Immediately after leaving NWA, Ice Cube wasted no time in establishing himself as a solo artist. 
he connected with the Bomb Squad, the legendary production team behind Public Enemy's success, to craft his debut solo album, America's Most Wanted, 1990. The album was a critical and commercial triumph, further solidifying Cube's reputation as one of the most important voices in rap. America's Most Wanted, with three Ks, was a bold, politically charged record that tackled issues like systemic racism, police brutality, and social injustice, continuing the themes Cube had explored with NWA but with a sharper, more focused edge. Songs like, The Nigga Ya Love To Hate, and the title track, America's Most Wanted, were unapologetic in their critique of American society, and Cube's delivery was more fierce and confident than ever. Cube's second album, Death Certificate, 1991, was even more controversial. The album is often cited as one of the most significant rap albums ever made, in part be because of its brutally honest portrayal of life in the black community and its incendiary commentary on race relations. The album's first side, labeled, The Death Side, depicted the struggles and hardships of life in the ghetto, while the second side, the life side, offered solutions and hope for the future. The track, No Vaseline, from, Death Certificate is one of the most famous diss tracks in hip-hop history. In it, Cube directly addressed his former NWA bandmates, accusing them of selling out and allowing themselves to be exploited by Jerry Heller. The song was a scathing attack, filled with cutting bars like, You lookin' like straight bozos, I saw it comin', that's why I went solo which left no doubt that Cube had no regrets about his decision to leave NWA but Ice wasn't just making waves in music, he was also starting to make his mark in Hollywood. His role as, Doughboy, in John Singleton's 1991 film, Boys and the Hood, was a revelation. The film was a critical and commercial success, and Cube's portrayal of a young man struggling to navigate life in the gang-infested streets of South Central Los Angeles earned him widespread acclaim. This role proved that Ice had the acting chops to match his musical talent and opened the door for a successful career in film. Boys and the Hood features standout performances from Cuba Gooding Jr., who plays Trey Styles, and Lawrence Fishburne as his father, Furious Styles. Morris Chestnut also delivers a memorable role as Ricky Baker, an athlete with dreams of a brighter future. The film was directed by John Singleton, whose work on this project earned him widespread acclaim. His direction powerfully captures the challenges and realities faced by the characters, making Boys and the Hood a significant and impactful film and puts these actors and John Singleton into the family tree. In 95, Cube took his talents behind the camera, writing and starring in the comedy, Friday, which has since become a cult classic. The film showcased his versatility as a writer and actor, blending humor with a slice-of-life depiction of life in South Central. It also introduced the world to Chris Tucker, who played the unforgettable character Smokey. Friday, was a box office hit and spawned two sequels, further cementing Cube's status as a multifaceted entertainer. Mike Epps joined the series in Next Friday, playing Day Day, Craig's hilariously eccentric cousin, a role that helped launch his career in stand-up comedy and film. Cat Williams made a memorable appearance in Friday After Next as Money Mike, the flamboyant, quick-witted pimp, which became one of his breakout roles, showcasing his unique comedic style. Michael Blackson appeared in Next Friday as the angry African customer at the record shop, delivering the unforgettable line, I can't get jiggy with this shit. This role helped boost Blackson's visibility, leading to a successful career in comedy. Terry Crews appeared in Friday After Next as Damon, the intimidating ex-convict, highlighting his comedic timing and versatility, which helped him transition into more comedic roles in television and film. Friday also rekindled the careers of John Witherspoon, who played Craig's father, and Tommy, Tiny, Lister Jr. aka in the wrestling world as Zeus, who played the notorious neighborhood bully, Debo. Both actors became fan favorites, with Witherspoon's comedic portrayal of the over-the-top father figure and Lister's menacing yet iconic role as Debo leading to renewed recognition and opportunities in the entertainment industry. Cube's influence extended beyond his own work. As a producer, he was instrumental in launching the careers of other artists and actors. Including actors Faison Love, Regina King, Anthony Johnson, DJ Pooh, Justin Pierce, and Reynaldo Ray. So add all of them to people standing behind the gate waiting for Cube to unlock at the Lynch Mob, a rap group he formed and produced, released their debut album, Gorillas in Demist, in 1992, which featured Cube heavily and became a critical success in the gangster rap genre. Though the Lynch Mob didn't achieve the same level of fame as Cube, they were a part of the growing West Coast hip-hop scene that Cube was helping to shape. 
West Side Connection, the supergroup Cube formed with WC and MAC-10, was another significant project. Their debut album, Bow Down, 1996, was a commercial success, driven by hits like, Bow Down, and, Gangsta's Make the World Go Round. The album was a celebration of West Coast culture and a declaration of dominance in the hip-hop world, with Cube at the helm. Throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s, Ice Cube continued to release successful solo albums, act in films, and expand his influence in Hollywood. Movies like, Barbershop, and, Are We There Yet, showcased Cube's ability to transition from hardcore rapper to mainstream star, appealing to a broad audience without losing his edge. By the time Cube had established himself as a solo artist and actor, his influence had already extended far beyond NWA. His work inspired a new generation of artists and set the stage for West Coast hip-hop to dominate the airwaves. Cube's decision to leave NWA might have been seen as a gamble at the time, but in hindsight, it was the catalyst for one of the most successful and influential careers in entertainment history. With Ice Cube now firmly established as a solo force, the spotlight shifts back to the remaining members of NWA, particularly Dr. Dre, whose next move would be to redefine the sound of West Coast hip-hop and launch the careers of some of the biggest names in the genre. After Cube's departure from NWA, Dre began to carve out his own legacy, one that would not only define West Coast hip-hop but also revolutionize the entire genre. Dre's influence is so vast that without him, modern hip-hop as we know it would likely be unrecognizable. He isn't just a producer and rapper, he is a visionary who steers the sound of rap music forever. Dr. Dre's split from NWA wasn't just a professional one, it was also personal. Tensions with Eazy-E and financial disputes with manager Jerry Heller led Dre to seek new opportunities. Enter Suge Knight, who, alongside Dre, co-founded Death Row Records in 1991. This label would go on to become one of the most iconic in hip-hop history, responsible for launching the careers of some of the biggest names in the industry. The first major release on Death Row was Dre's solo debut, The Chronic, 1992. The album introduced the world to G-Funk, a subgenre of hip-hop characterized by its smooth, laid-back beats, heavy use of synthesizers, and samples from 1970s funk music, particularly George Clinton's Parliament Funkadelic. The Chronic was a game-changer, with tracks like Everybody Is Fuckin' With Dre Day, Nothing But A, G, Thang, and Let Me Ride, becoming instant classics. The album not only solidified Dre's status as a top-tier producer but also introduced the world to a young Snoop Doggy Dog, who featured prominently on the album and would soon become a superstar in his own right. Snoop Dogg's debut album, Doggy Style, 1993, was another massive success for Death Row and Dr. Dre with hits like, Gin and Juice, and, Who Am I? What's My Name? Snoop became the face of West Coast hip-hop, and G-Funk became the dominant sound in the genre. Dre's production was the driving force behind this success, and his ability to craft beats that perfectly complemented an artist's flow was unmatched. But Dr. Dre's influence didn't stop with Snoop Dogg. He also played a crucial role in the careers of several other Death Row artists. Warren G., Dre's stepbrother, made waves with his debut album, Regulate. G Funk Era, 1994, which featured the hit single, Regulate, featuring Nate Dogg. The song was a crossover hit, blending G Funk with a more accessible sound that appealed to a wider audience. Warren G.'s success further cemented Dre's influence, even as Dre wasn't directly involved in the production of Regulate. His G-Funk sound was the foundation on which the album was built. The Dog Pound, a duo consisting of Daz Dillinger and Corrupt, also benefited from Dre's influence. Their debut album, Dog Food, 1995, was another hit for Death Row, with tracks like, New York, New York, and, Let's Play House, showcasing the G-Funk sound. Dre's mentorship and production guidance were instrumental in the group's success, even though he didn't produce the entire album. However, Death Row's dominance was not without controversy. The label became notorious for its violent image and Suge Knight's heavy-handed tactics, which included intimidating and coercing artists like Vanilla Ice and rivals like Sean Combs alike. This dark side of Death Row would eventually contribute to its downfall, but not before the label left an indelible mark on hip-hop. One of the most significant moments in Dr. Dre's career came in 1996 when he decided to leave Death Row due to growing tensions with Suge Knight and the increasingly volatile atmosphere at the label. Dre's departure from Death Row marked the beginning of a new chapter in his career, one that would see him create his own label, Aftermath Entertainment. Aftermath Entertainment started off slowly, 
with Dre's initial projects, such as, Dr. Dre Presents. The Aftermath, 1996, not achieving the success he had hoped for. However, everything changed in 1999 when Dre discovered a rapper who happens to be white, from Detroit named Eminem. Dre's decision to sign Eminem was met with skepticism from many in the hip-hop community, but it would turn out to be one of the most significant moves in the history of the genre. Eminem's debut album under Aftermath, the Slim Shady LP, 1999, was an instant success, introducing the world to Eminem's unique blend of dark humor, controversial lyrics, and incredible technical skill. Dre's production on the album was top-notch, providing the perfect backdrop for Eminem's rapid-fire delivery and twisted storytelling. Songs like, The Way I Am, My Name Is, and Guilty Conscience, became massive hits, and Eminem quickly became one of the biggest stars in the world. With the success of Eminem, Aftermath Entertainment became a powerhouse label, and Dr. Dre's influence grew even more. He went on to produce Eminem's next two albums, The Marshall Mathers LP, 2000, and The Eminem Show, 2002, both of which were critical and commercial juggernauts. Dre's production was key to Eminem's sound, blending dark, brooding beats with catchy hooks that appealed to both hardcore hip-hop fans and mainstream audiences. M's success also paved the way for the rise of 50 Cent, another Aftermath signee whose debut album, Get Rich or Die Tryin', 2003, was a massive hit. The album, produced by Dre and Eminem, featured tracks like, In Da Club, and, 21 Questions, which dominated the charts and solidified 50 Cent as a major player in the rap game. Once again, Dre's production was at the forefront, helping to craft an album that would become one of the best-selling hip-hop records of all time. As Aftermath continued to dominate the charts, Dr. Dre's influence expanded even further. He became known not just as a producer, but as a mentor and tastemaker who could identify and develop new talent. His ability to stay relevant and adapt to the changing landscape of hip-hop set him apart from many of his peers. Throughout the 2000s and 2010s, Dre continued to work with some of the biggest names in the industry, including Kendrick Lamar, whose major label debut, Good Kid, Mad City, 2012, was released on Aftermath. Kendrick's album was a critical and commercial success, with Dre's guidance helping to shape the sound and narrative of the project. Songs like, Swimming Pools Drank and, Bitch, Don't Kill My Vibe, showcased Kendrick's lyrical prowess and storytelling ability, while Dre's production provided a modern yet classic West Coast vibe. Dr. Dre's impact on the industry is immeasurable. From G-Funk to gangster rap to the rise of some of the biggest stars in hip-hop, his influence has touched every corner of the genre. Without Dre, there would be no Snoop Dogg, no Eminem, no Kendrick Lamar, no West Coast sound as we know it he wasn't just a member of NWA, he was the architect of an entire era of hip-hop, and his legacy continues to shape the music we listen to today. As we continue exploring the NWA family tree, it's clear that Dre's contributions have created branches that reach far and wide. But before we move on, we can't overlook another key figure in this story, Eazy-E, whose entrepreneurial spirit helped to build Ruthless Records and bring NWA's music to the world. Eric Wright, better known as Eazy-E, was the driving force behind the formation of NWA and a pioneering figure in the business side of gangsta rap. Often dubbed the godfather of gangsta rap, Eazy-E's influence extended far beyond his role as a rapper, he was a savvy entrepreneur who understood the power of independence in the music industry. Easy es journey into the music business began with a small fortune he amassed from street hustling in Compton. Using this money, he co-founded Ruthless Records in 1986 with his partner Jerry Heller, an experienced music manager. Ruthless Records would soon become one of the most influential independent labels in hip-hop, launching the careers of several iconic artists and groups. One of the first projects under Ruthless was, N.W.A. and the Posse, 1987, a compilation album that featured early recordings from N.W.A. as well as tracks from other artists affiliated with the label. Although it didn't achieve massive success initially, the album set the stage for what was to come. The raw, unfiltered content and aggressive beats provided a glimpse into the emerging sound of West Coast rap. The true breakthrough for Ruthless Records came with the release of, Straight Outta Compton, 1988, NWA's seminal album that brought gangster rap into the mainstream. Easy e played a crucial role in the album's creation, not only as a performer but also as an executive producer. He understood the importance of controlling the business side of music, ensuring that Ruthless Records retained ownership of the group's work. This decision would prove to be financially lucrative for Easy e as, 
straight out of Compton, became a cultural phenomenon. Easy es influence didn't stop with NWA under his leadership, Ruthless Records signed and developed several other successful acts. One of the most notable was Bone Thugs in Harmony, a Cleveland-based group that combined rapid-fire rapping with harmonized vocals. Their debut EP, Creepin' on a Come Up, 1994, and subsequent album, E. 1999 Eternal, 1995, were major successes, with the latter producing the hit single, The Crossroads, which became a tribute to Eazy-E after his death in 1995. Bone Thugs and Harmony's unique sound and Easy es guidance helped them become one of the most successful rap groups of the 1990s. Easy es role as an executive extended beyond just signing artists, he was also deeply involved in the creative process. He had a keen ear for talent and a knack for identifying what would resonate with audiences. This is evident in the success of artists like Above the Law, whose 1990 album, Livin' Like Hustlers, was produced by Dr. Dre and helped define the sound of West Coast rap. Easy es business acumen allowed Ruthless Records to maintain a strong presence in the industry, even as other independent labels struggled to keep up. However, Easy es business dealings weren't without controversy. His partnership with Jerry Heller became a point of contention within NWA, particularly for Ice Cube, who felt that Heller was taking advantage of the group financially. This tension ultimately led to Ice Cube's departure from NWA and his subsequent diss track, no Vaseline, which called out both Eazy-E and Heller for their business practices. Despite these controversies, Eazy-E's contributions to hip-hop are undeniable. He was instrumental in bringing the gritty realities of street life in Compton to a global audience, and his work laid the foundation for the rise of West Coast rap. His entrepreneurial spirit helped pave the way for future independent artists and labels, showing that success in the music industry didn't have to come at the expense of creative control. Easy es legacy is also marked by his untimely death in 1995 due to complications from AIDS. His passing shocked the hip-hop community and brought attention to the importance of HIV, AIDS awareness. Despite his short life, Easy es impact on the industry is still felt today, and his work continues to influence new generations of artists. As we continue to explore the NWA family tree, it's clear that without Easy es vision and business acumen, the trajectory of hip-hop, especially on the West Coast, would have been vastly different. His ability to recognize talent, combined with his determination to maintain control over his music, helped to shape the sound and culture of an entire genre. Dre is one of the most influential figures in hip-hop, not just as a member of NWA, but as the architect of an entire sound, G-Funk. After his time with NWA, Dre embarked on a solo career that would redefine West Coast rap and lay the groundwork for the careers of countless artists, including Snoop Dogg, Eminem, and 50 Cent. Following the disbandment of NWA in the early 1990s, Dr. Dre was ready to forge his own path. He left Ruthless Records amidst growing tensions and disputes over financial issues, particularly with Eazy E and Jerry Heller. Dre, along with Suge Knight, then co founded Death Row Records in 1991 a label that would soon dominate the West Coast hip-hop scene. Dre's first solo album, The Chronic, 1992, marked a turning point in hip-hop. It introduced the world to G-Funk, a subgenre characterized by slow, heavy beats, melodic synthesizers, and deep bass lines, all layered with soulful samples from the 1970s. This sound was a stark contrast to the harsher, more abrasive production style of earlier gangsta rap, offering a smoother, more accessible version of West Coast hip-hop. The Chronic was a critical and commercial success, solidifying Dr. Dre's status as a production genius. The album produced several hit singles, including Nothing But A, G, Thang, which featured a young, charismatic rapper named Snoop Doggy Dog. Snoop's laid back flow and distinctive voice complemented Dre's production perfectly, making Nothing But A, G, Thang an instant classic and a defining track of the G Funk era. The album also included tracks like Let Me Ride, and, Lyrical Gangbang, further cementing its place in hip-hop history. Dr. Dre's, The Chronic, 2001, stands as a landmark in hip-hop, marking a definitive moment in West Coast rap and showcasing the genre's evolution. Its impact was not just in its sound but in its influence on artists and the music industry. The album was highly anticipated, building immense excitement following the success of, The Chronic. When it finally dropped, it didn't disappoint, it surpassed expectations and cemented its place as a superior follow-up One of the album's highlights was the debut of Eminem, whose inclusion on The Chronic 2001 introduced him to a wider audience and set the stage for his future success.
His appearance on the track, Forgot About Dre, was a significant moment, marking the beginning of a prolific collaboration with Dr. Dre Weil. The Chronic 2001 is celebrated for its groundbreaking sound and influence, it also highlighted the changes in the West Coast rap scene. RBX and the Lady of Rage, who had been prominent on the original, The Chronic, had less visibility in the follow-up despite their reduced roles, the album's impact was profound, showcasing a new era in hip-hop while building on the foundation laid by its predecessor. The release of The Chronic 2001 not only advanced Dr. Dre's legacy but also reshaped the hip-hop landscape, influencing the direction of future artists and trends in the genre. Snoop Dogg's debut album, Doggy Style, 1993, was the next major project under Dre's production. Released through Death Row Records, Doggy Style was an immediate success, debuting at number one on the Billboard 200 and solidifying Snoop's place in the rap pantheon. Tracks like Gin and Juice and Who Am I? What's My Name? became anthems, showcasing Snoop's unique style and Dre's impeccable production. The album's success also helped establish Death Row Records as a powerhouse in the music industry. Dr. Dre's influence didn't stop with Snoop Dogg. He played a pivotal role in the careers of several other artists, most notably Tupac Shakur. Dre produced California Love, one of Tupac's biggest hits, which became an anthem for the West Coast and a symbol of the dominance of West Coast rap in the mid-90s. The collaboration between Dre and Tupac on All Eyes on Me, 1996 further demonstrated Dre's versatility and his ability to craft hits that resonated with a wide audience. However, tensions within Death Row Records, particularly between Dr. Dre and Suge Knight, led to Dre's departure from the label in 1996. This move marked the beginning of a new chapter in Dre's career. He founded Aftermath Entertainment, a label that would go on to discover and nurture some of the most successful artists in hip-hop history. One of the first major signings to Aftermath was Eminem, a white rapper from Detroit whose lyrical prowess and controversial subject matter quickly made him one of the most talked about artists in the industry. Dre produced The Slim Shady LP, 1999, which catapulted Eminem to superstardom. Tracks like Stan and Guilty Conscience showcased Eminem's sharp wit and dark humor, while Dre's production provided the perfect backdrop for his rhymes. The partnership between Dre and Eminem would continue to produce hits, including The Marshall Mathers LP, 2000 and The Eminem Show, 2002, both of which are considered classics in hip-hop. Aftermath also became the home for 50 Cent, another major figure in 2000s hip-hop. 50 Cent's debut album, Get Rich or Die Tryin', 2003, was produced by Dre and Eminem and became an instant classic, selling millions of copies worldwide. Tracks like, In Da Club, and, P.I.M.P., dominated the charts and solidified 50 Cent's place in hip-hop. Dre's ability to craft hits for different artists, each with their own unique style, showcased his versatility and cemented his legacy as one of the greatest producers in music history. Beyond his work as a producer, Dr. Dre also had a significant impact on the technology side of the music industry. In 2006, he co-founded Beats by Dre, a line of headphones and audio products that quickly became a cultural phenomenon. The brand's success culminated in its acquisition by Apple Inc. in 2014 for $3 billion, making Dr. Dre one of the wealthiest figures in the entertainment industry. Dre's influence extends far beyond the music itself. He helped shape the careers of some of the biggest names in hip-hop, and his innovations in production have had a lasting impact on the sound of the genre. His work has also influenced other producers and artists, creating a ripple effect that can still be felt today. Without Dr. Dre, the landscape of hip-hop would be vastly different, and many of the artists we consider legends today might never have achieved the same level of success. His ability to identify and nurture talent, combined with his innovative approach to production, has made him a true gatekeeper in the music industry, despite his own claims to the contrary. The DOC the ghostwriter behind the legends the story of NWA and its extended family tree wouldn't be complete without discussing the DOC, the often unsung hero who played a crucial role in shaping the lyrical style of West Coast hip-hop. Born Tracy Curry, the DOC was a gifted lyricist and rapper who became an integral part of NWA's success and went on to influence some of the biggest names in the industry. The DOC started his career as a member of the Fila Fresh Crew, a hip-hop group from Dallas, Texas. The group caught the attention of Dr. Dre and Eazy-E, who invited them to contribute to the NWA and the Posse compilation album in 1987. Though the group eventually disbanded, the DOC's talent stood out, 
and he soon became a close collaborator with Dr. Dre and N.W.A. as a ghostwriter for N.W.A., the D.O.C. penned some of the group's most iconic lyrics. His contributions were instrumental in the success of tracks like Express Yourself and Gangsta Gangsta, where his sharp wit and intricate wordplay helped define the group's rebellious and confrontational style. While Ice Cube was the primary lyricist for N.W.A., the D.O.C. played a significant role in refining and enhancing the group's lyrical content. In 1989, the D.O.C. released his debut solo album, No One Can Do It Better. Produced by Dr. Dre, the album was a critical and commercial success, showcasing the D.O.C.'s lyrical prowess and solidifying his place in the West Coast rap scene. Tracks like, It's Funky Enough, The D.O.C. and The Doctor, and, The Formula, became hits, and the album is still considered a classic in the genre. The D.O.C.'s smooth flow, clever wordplay, and ability to craft memorable hooks made him a standout artist in his own right. Tragically, just months after the release of his debut album, the D.O.C. was involved in a car accident that severely damaged his vocal cords. The injury left him unable to rap in the same way, effectively ending his career as a performer. However, this didn't stop the D.O.C. from continuing to influence the industry. He shifted his focus to ghostwriting and continued to work closely with Dr. Dre and other artists. The DOC's influence is particularly evident on Dr. Dre's The Chronic. His ghostwriting helped shape the album's narrative, contributing to tracks like Let Me Ride and Nothing But A, G, Thang. Even though the DOC couldn't perform himself, his lyrical genius was still a driving force behind some of the biggest hits of the era. In the years that followed, the DOC continued to write for artists under the Death Row label, including Snoop Dogg and Tupac Shakur. His contributions were crucial in crafting the lyrical content that defined the West Coast sound in the 1990s. Despite his vocal injury, the DOC remained a key player behind the scenes, helping to shape the careers of some of hip-hop's most legendary figures. The DOC's influence extends beyond just the West Coast. His work with Dr. Dre eventually led to collaborations with artists like Eminem, who has credited the DOC as one of his inspirations. The DOC's ability to craft complex and impactful lyrics left a lasting impression on Eminem, who has since become one of the most respected lyricists in hip-hop. In 2003, the DOC underwent surgery to restore his vocal cords, and while his voice has never fully returned to its original strength, he has occasionally returned to the studio. In recent years, he has expressed interest in releasing new music and continuing his legacy as one of hip-hop's greatest writers. The DOC's story is a testament to the power of perseverance and the lasting impact one individual can have on an entire genre. Though he may not have received the same level of fame as some of his contemporaries, his contributions to the success of N.W.A., Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and many others are undeniable. Without the DOC's lyrical genius, the landscape of West Coast hip-hop would be very different, and many of the iconic tracks we know today might never have come to fruition. The DOC's journey through the highs and lows of the music industry highlights the often overlooked role of ghostwriters in hip-hop. His ability to craft lyrics that resonated with audiences worldwide helped elevate N.W.A. and its extended family to legendary status. In the grand tapestry of hip-hop history, the DOC is a crucial thread, connecting the raw, rebellious energy of N.W.A. to the polished, platinum-selling success of artists like Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and Eminem. As we continue to explore the N.W.A. family tree, one of the most significant branches that emerged in the 1990s was led by Warren G. Often referred to as the architect of G-Funk, Warren G.'s influence on West Coast hip-hop is undeniable. While he may have been overshadowed at times by his stepbrother Dr. Dre, Warren G. carved out his own legacy, playing around in Dre's studio, with a sound that became synonymous with the West Coast. Warren Griffin III, known to the world as Warren G., grew up in Long Beach, California. His early exposure to music came from his stepbrother Dr. Dre, who was already making waves with N.W.A. Although Warren G. didn't initially join N.W.A., he was always close to the action, absorbing the sounds and styles that would later influence his own music. In 94, Warren released his debut album, Regulate, G-Funk Era, which became a defining moment in hip-hop history. The album's lead single, Regulate, featuring Nate Dogg, became an instant classic. The track's smooth, laid-back beat combined with Warren G's relaxed flow and Nate Dogg's soulful hooks created a new sound that would dominate the West Coast for years to come. Regulate wasn't just a hit, it was a cultural phenomenon. The track sampled Michael McDonald's, I Keep Forgettin', 
blending it with G-Funk's signature heavy basslines and synthesizers. Warren G's storytelling on, Regulate, painted a vivid picture of life in the streets of Long Beach, resonating with listeners across the country. The song's success propelled, Regulate, G-Funk era, to triple platinum status and solidified Warren G's place in hip-hop history. The G-Funk sound that Warren G helped popularize became the blueprint for West Coast hip-hop in the mid-1990s. Characterized by slow, melodic beats, heavy bass, and smooth synthesizers, G-Funk was a departure from the harder, more aggressive sound of earlier West Coast rap. It was more laid-back, more accessible, and it quickly became the dominant style in the region. Warren G's influence didn't stop with his own music. He was instrumental in introducing and producing for other artists, helping to shape the careers of several key figures in the West Coast rap scene. One of the most notable was Nate Dogg, whose collaborations with Warren G on tracks like Regulate and Nobody Does It Better made him one of the most recognizable voices in hip-hop. Warren G also played a crucial role in the formation of the group 213, which consisted of Warren G, Nate Dogg, and Snoop Dogg. The group's early recordings helped pave the way for Snoop Dogg's solo career, with Warren G's production and guidance being key factors in Snoop's rise to stardom. While 213 never officially released an album during their early years, their influence on the West Coast sound was undeniable. In addition to his work with Nate Dogg and Snoop Dogg, Warren G collaborated with a wide range of artists throughout the 1990s and 2000s. His production credits include work with Tupac, MC Breed, and The Twins, among others. Warren G's ability to craft smooth, melodic beats made him a sought-after producer, and his fingerprints can be found on many classic West Coast tracks. One of the most significant aspects of Warren G's career is his ability to stay true to his sound while continuing to evolve. Even as the hip-hop landscape changed over the years, Warren G remained relevant by sticking to the G-Funk sound that he helped create. His later albums, such as, Take a Look Over Your Shoulder, and, The Return of the Regulator, may not have achieved the same commercial success as his debut, but they still showcased his unique style and ability to craft timeless music. Warren G's impact on hip-hop extends beyond just his music, he is also credited with helping to bridge the gap between the West Coast and other regions, particularly the South. His collaborations with Southern artists like UGK and Scarface helped to introduce G-Funk to a new audience and expand its influence beyond California. Moreover, Warren G's work laid the foundation for future generations of West Coast artists. His influence can be heard in the music of artists like Kendrick Lamar, who has cited Warren G as an inspiration. The smooth, melodic beats that Warren G popularized in the 1990s continued to resonate with listeners today, proving the lasting impact of his contributions to hip-hop. In many ways, Warren G's career embodies the spirit of the West Coast, laid back, innovative, and always evolving. His ability to create a sound that was both unique and accessible helped to define an era of hip-hop and influenced countless artists who followed in his footsteps. Without Warren G and the G-Funk era, the sound of West Coast hip-hop would be very different, and many of the classic tracks we know and love today might never have been made. As we continue to explore the NWA family tree, it's clear that Warren G's contributions to hip-hop are just as significant as those of his more famous peers. His work as a producer, rapper, and collaborator helped to shape the sound of an entire coast and left an indelible mark on the genre as a whole. To truly appreciate the legacy of Ice Cube and NWA, one must also explore the impact of the Lynch Mob, a group that emerged directly from Cube's sphere of influence. Formed in 1989, the Lynch Mob was not just a testament to Cube's influence but also a reflection of his commitment to social commentary and his ability to nurture new talent within his extended musical family. The Lynch Mob was founded by Ice Cube himself, who played a significant role in shaping the group's direction and sound. The group's lineup included members like JD, T-Bone, and Machiavelli. Though not as commercially successful as NWA, the Lynch Mob made significant contributions to the West Coast hip-hop scene, thanks to Cube's vision and mentorship. The Lynch Mob's debut album, Gorillas in the Mist, released in 1992, was a clear extension of Ice Cube's socially conscious and politically charged style. The album was notable for its hard-hitting lyrics and its exploration of themes like racial injustice and systemic oppression, which were also central to Cube's work with NWA tracks like, Gorillas in the Mist, and, Murder Show, provided a platform for the group to voice their experiences and frustrations, continuing the legacy of addressing social issues through music. The Lynch Mob's influence extended beyond their own releases. By promoting and producing for the Lynch Mob, 
Ice Cube demonstrated his role as a gatekeeper and mentor in the hip-hop industry. The group's commitment to social commentary and their unapologetic approach to addressing societal issues helped pave the way for future artists who sought to use their platform for activism and change. The group's association with Ice Cube also opened doors for collaborations with other influential artists. Their style and message resonated with a wide audience, and they became known for their raw, unfiltered approach to addressing issues that were often overlooked in mainstream media. Though the Lynch Mob didn't achieve the same level of commercial success as N.W.A. or Ice Cube's solo career, their contributions to the genre are significant. They carried forward the legacy of N.W.A.'s hard-hitting, socially conscious rap, and their work laid the groundwork for future West Coast artists who sought to combine social commentary with their music. The legacy of the Lynch Mob is evident in the work of many contemporary artists who continued to draw inspiration from their style and message. Their approach to addressing social issues through music helped to shape the direction of West Coast hip-hop and influenced artists who came after them, including those who continued to push the boundaries of the genre. The Lynch Mob story is a crucial part of the N.W.A. family tree. Their work not only reflects the influence of Ice Cube but also highlights his role in nurturing and promoting new talent within the hip-hop community. The group's dedication to social commentary and their contribution to the West Coast sound underscore the far-reaching impact of Ice Cube and N.W.A. on the evolution of hip-hop. The mob's impact on the genre is a testament to Cube's ability to shape and influence the music industry. Their work extended the legacy of N.W.A. and contributed to the development of a sound and message that continues to resonate with audiences today. DJ Quick, born David Marvin Blake, is renowned for his innovative production and smooth, funky beats. His debut album, Quick as the Name, showcased his ability to blend funk, soul, and hip-hop into a distinctive West Coast style. Hits like, Tonight, and, Sweet Black Pussy, are prime examples of his production prowess. Being an artist from Compton, we add him to the tree, because no NWA, maybe no Compton. Quick's influence extends beyond his own work, shaping the sound of many West Coast artists and collaborating with Snoop, Dre, and Pac. MC8, born Aaron Tyler, is a significant figure in West Coast rap. His work with Compton's Most Wanted and his solo albums, including, We Come Strapped, have made him a prominent voice in the genre. Hits like, Straight Up Menace, showcase his gritty, street-oriented style. MC8's raw depiction of life in Compton has influenced other West Coast artists and contributed to the broader narrative of West Coast hip-hop. Arabian Prince, born Kim Renard Nasal, was an original member of N.W.A. and contributed to the group's debut album, N.W.A. and the Posse. Although he left the group before, straight out of Compton, his influence on N.W.A.'s early formation is noteworthy. His solo album, Brother Arab, explored social and political themes and added a unique flavor to West Coast hip-hop. DJ Quick, MC8, and Arabian Prince each brought unique elements to West Coast hip-hop. Their contributions helped shape the genre and influence new artists. Their work reflects the diverse nature of West Coast rap and underscores their importance in the N.W.A. family tree. The Lynch Mob, founded by Ice Cube, was an essential offshoot of his solo career and a significant part of the broader N.W.A. family tree. The group included members such as J.D. and Mac-10, who contributed to the extension of Ice Cube's influence in West Coast hip-hop. Their debut album, Gorillas in the Mist, released in 1992, featured tracks like, Harvest for the World, and showcased a blend of political and social commentary with the hard-hitting beats characteristic of Ice Cube's style. The Lynch Mob's work continued Ice Cube's legacy of addressing social issues and reflecting the realities of life in Compton. The group's influence extended beyond their own music, contributing to the West Coast sound and providing a platform for artists connected to Ice Cube's vision. Their impact on the genre highlights the way Ice Cube's influence spread through various branches of the N.W.A. family tree. West Side Connection formed by Ice Cube, W.C., and Mac-10, emerged as a powerhouse in the late 1990s. Their debut album, Bow Down, released in 1996, solidified their place in West Coast hip-hop. The album featured hits like, Bow Down, and, Gangsta Nation, showcasing a powerful collaboration that combined their individual styles into a cohesive sound. Cube's leadership in West Side Connection helped bridge the gap between his earlier work with N.W.A. and his subsequent solo success. The group's music, characterized by its aggressive lyrics and West Coast flavor, played a significant role in shaping the direction of the genre during the 1990s. The game, from Compton, and a lifelong N.W.A. fan as shown by one of his tattoos, 
has been a prominent figure in modern hip-hop, known for his lyrical prowess and storytelling ability. Straight from Compton, California, the game quickly gained recognition with his debut album, the documentary, 2005, which featured hits like, Hate It or Love It, and, How We Do. His association with Dr. Dre and 50 Cent helped catapult his career, and he has since released several successful albums, solidifying his place in the hip-hop industry. The game's music often reflects his experiences growing up in Compton, addressing themes of gang violence, street life, and personal struggles. His authenticity and raw storytelling have resonated with fans, making him a significant voice in modern hip-hop. DJ Quick is also a legendary producer. He has had a profound influence on West Coast hip-hop. Known for his smooth production style and innovative use of funk and soul samples, DJ Quick has worked with numerous artists, including Tupac, Snoop Dogg, and Eazy-E. His production credits include hits like, Tonight, and, Pitch and Own a Party, showcasing his ability to create timeless tracks. DJ Quick's influence extends beyond his own music, as he has played a crucial role in shaping the sound of West Coast hip-hop. His collaborations with other artists have helped define the genre, and his production techniques continue to inspire new generations of producers. Game and Quick's contributions to hip-hop are significant, with both artists leaving an indelible mark on the genre. Their music and influence have helped shape the sound of modern hip-hop, ensuring that the legacy of West Coast hip-hop continues to thrive. The beef has become a genre in hip-hop, characterized by diss tracks and rivalries, it has significantly shaped the culture, driving both competition and creativity among artists. One of the most renowned examples is Ice Cube's No Vaseline, released in 1991. This track is celebrated as one of the most ferocious diss tracks in hip-hop history, targeting his former NWA group members and illustrating the intense internal conflicts that arose within the group. The roots of the beef can be traced back to the early days of hip-hop. In the late 1980s, the rivalry between KRS-One and MC Sean was a prime example of how lyrical confrontations could capture public attention. KRS-One's, The Bridge Is Over, directly challenged MC Sean's, The Bridge, marking a significant moment in hip-hop's competitive nature. The 1990s saw the rise of some of the most high-profile feuds, notably the East Coast versus West Coast rivalry. This conflict featured Tupac Shakur and the notorious B.I.G. at its core, with their diss tracks and personal disputes escalating tensions between the coasts. This feud not only captivated fans but also had a profound impact on the industry, highlighting the volatile nature of beef culture. Some suggest they both died for it. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Ice Cube continued to be involved in notable beefs, including those with Cypress Hill in common. These disputes, marked by sharp lyrical exchanges and public confrontations, further defined Cube's place in the diss track genre. More recent rivalries, such as Drake vs. Kendrick Lamar, demonstrate that the beef genre remains a powerful force in hip-hop, influencing both artists' careers and the broader industry. The impact of the beef genre is multifaceted. On one hand, it has driven artists to push creative boundaries, resulting in some of the most memorable tracks in hip-hop history. On the other hand, it has also led to violence and tragedy, underscoring the darker aspects of these rivalries. Despite these challenges, beefs continue to be a crucial part of hip-hop culture, reflecting the competitive spirit and personal rivalries that define the genre. Roystaw59, hailing from Detroit, is known for his intricate lyricism and storytelling. He gained recognition in the late 1990s and early 2000s, collaborating with Eminem as part of the duo Bad Meets Evil. Royce's solo career has been marked by critically acclaimed albums such as Death is Certain, 2004, and Book of Ryan, 2018. His ability to tackle personal and social issues in his music has earned him respect within the hip-hop community. 50 Cent, born Curtis Jackson, rose to fame with his debut album Get Rich or Die Tryin', 2003, which featured hits like, In Da Club, and, 21 Questions. Discovered by Eminem and Dr. Dre, 50 Cent's gritty lyrics and charismatic persona quickly made him a household name. His success continued with subsequent albums and ventures into acting and business. Beyond music, 50 Cent has made a significant impact on television. He is the executive producer of the hit Stars series Power, which debuted in 2014 and ran for six successful seasons. The show's popularity led to multiple spin-offs, including Power Book 2, Ghost, Power Book 3, Raising Canaan, and Power Book 4, Force. His other series, BMF, has also been a hit, expanding into its own universe. 
50 Cent's involvement in these projects goes beyond just producing, he is hands-on, working closely with writers and showrunners to ensure the success of his shows. 50 Cent's influence on television has helped bring hip-hop culture to a broader audience, and his success in the industry has opened doors for other artists to explore opportunities in TV and film. His ability to create compelling content has solidified his place as a powerhouse in both music and television. Both Royce.59 and 50 Cent have had a significant impact on hip-hop. Royce's lyrical prowess and introspective themes have influenced many artists, while 50 Cent's commercial success and crossover appeal have helped bring hip-hop to a broader audience. Their connections to other influential figures, such as Eminem and Dr. Dre, further highlight their importance in the genre. Other notable branches from the strong Dre slash Eminem branch of the tree include Stat Quo, Obi Trice, Easy Mill, all the way to M's supergroups D12 aka The Dirty Dozen Rest in Peace Bugs and Proof, and the other supergroup Slaughterhouse. Then there is also Yellow Wolf a great in his own right. Suge Knight, born Marion Hugh Knight Jr., is a pivotal figure in the history of hip-hop, particularly in the West Coast scene. As the co-founder of Death Row Records alongside Dr. Dre, Knight played a crucial role in the mainstream explosion of gangster rap in the early 1990s. Death Row Records released some of the most iconic albums in hip-hop history, including Dr. Dre's The Chronic and Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style. Knight's business acumen and fearless negotiation style were key to his success. He was known for his ability to spot talent and secure groundbreaking deals and contracts, which not only boosted his label's success but also reshaped the music industry's approach to artist management. Knight's ability to secure a distribution deal with Interscope Records was instrumental in depth Rowe's early success. However, Knight's career was also marked by controversy and legal issues. He faced numerous charges related to organized criminal activity, gang affiliations, and narcotics. Despite the controversies, Knight's influence on the rap scene was considerable. Death Row Records became the biggest record company in hip-hop during the early 90s, with its artists experiencing immense commercial success. The label's roster included some of the most influential artists in hip-hop, such as Tupac Shakur, whose album All Eyes On Me became one of the best-selling hip-hop albums of all time. Knight's impact extended beyond music, as he explored other ventures and left a lasting legacy on the industry. He was known for his aggressive tactics, which included using intimidation and violence in his business dealings. This approach, while controversial, helped solidify Death Row's dominance in the industry. Knight's life outside of music was tumultuous, with legal troubles culminating in a 2015 hit-and-run incident that resulted in the death of Terry Carter. Knight is currently serving a 28-year sentence for voluntary manslaughter. Despite his legal issues, Knight's contributions to the rap industry and his role in shaping the sound and direction of West Coast hip-hop during its formative years remained significant Knight's influence on the music industry is undeniable. His ability to identify and nurture talent, combined with his fearless approach to business, helped shape the landscape of hip-hop in the 1990s. Death Row Records' success paved the way for future hip-hop labels and artists, and Knight's legacy continues to be felt in the industry today. In a notable turn of events, Snoop Dogg acquired Death Row Records in 2022. This acquisition was symbolic of the ongoing influence and transformation within the hip-hop industry. Death Row Records, the label where Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre's careers were significantly shaped, saw a new chapter under Snoop's ownership. The move was seen as a way to bring the label back to its roots and continue its legacy. NWA's influence on hip-hop extended far beyond the West Coast, reaching into the Southern and East Coast scenes and leaving a lasting impact on the genre as a whole. In the South, NWA's raw and unapologetic style resonated with many artists who were also dealing with themes of poverty, violence, and systemic oppression. Groups like the Ghetto Boys from Houston and Outkast from Atlanta drew inspiration from NWA's fearless approach to addressing social issues. The Ghetto Boys' controversial lyrics and gritty storytelling mirrored NWA's style, while Outkast's innovative sound and willingness to push boundaries reflected NWA's influence on the genre's evolution. On the East Coast, NWA's impact was equally significant. While the East Coast had its own distinct sound and style, NWA's success demonstrated the commercial viability of hardcore rap and opened doors for East Coast artists to explore more aggressive and politically charged themes. Public Enemy, known for their militant and socially conscious lyrics, shared a similar ethos with NWA, and their music often tackled issues of racism and police brutality.
The success of NWA also paved the way for other East Coast artists like Nas and the Notorious B.I.G. to incorporate more gritty and realistic portrayals of urban life into their music. NWA's influence on Southern and East Coast hip-hop is a testament to their groundbreaking contribution to the genre, their willingness to address controversial topics and push the boundaries of what was acceptable in mainstream music inspired countless artists across the country to do the same. As a result, NWA's legacy continues to be felt in hip-hop scenes far beyond their West Coast origins. Jerry Heller was a prominent music manager and businessman, best known for his management of West Coast rap pioneers NWA and Eazy-E. Heller's career began in the 1960s and 1970s, representing a wide range of artists including Journey, Marvin Gaye, Van Morrison, and The Who. However, it was his work in the mid-1980s with Ruthless Records that cemented his legacy in the music industry. Heller co-founded Ruthless Records with Eazy-E, and together they played a crucial role in the emergence of West Coast rap. Under Heller's management, Ruthless Records signed and promoted groundbreaking acts such as NWA, the DOC, and Bone Thugs and Harmony. Heller's business acumen and industry connections helped Ruthless Records achieve significant commercial success, selling millions of records and establishing the label as a dominant force in hip-hop. After Easy's death the label went to his wife, and she did not have the connection with the artists like Easy did, as once described by Hobson, who inevitably left the label. Despite Jerry's contributions to the success of NWA and Ruthless Records, Heller's legacy is not without controversy. He was often portrayed as a shrewd and exploitative manager, particularly in the 2015 film Straight Outta Compton. The film depicted Heller as a manipulative figure who took advantage of the young artists he managed. While some argue that this portrayal is unfair, it has nonetheless shaped public perception of Heller's role in the music industry. Heller's impact on the music industry extends beyond his work with NWA. His management style and business strategies influenced the way record labels and managers approached artist development and promotion. Heller's ability to navigate the complexities of the music industry and secure lucrative deals for his artists set a precedent for future managers and executives. Jerry Heller's role in the music industry was multifaceted and influential. His work with Ruthless Records and NWA helped shape the sound and direction of West Coast rap, and his business strategies left a lasting impact on the industry. Despite the controversies surrounding his career, Heller's contributions to the music world are undeniable. NWA's legacy continues to influence modern hip-hop, with artists like Kendrick Lamar embodying the spirit and ethos of the group. Kendrick Lamar, a Compton native, has often cited NWA as a significant influence on his music and career. His work reflects the same raw honesty and social consciousness that characterized NWA's music. Kendrick Lamar's debut album, Good Kid, Mad City 2012, was a critical and commercial success, earning him widespread acclaim and solidifying his place in the hip-hop industry. The album's narrative style and exploration of life in Compton drew comparisons to NWA's groundbreaking work. Tracks like, Mad City, and, The Art of Peer Pressure, showcased Lamar's ability to tell compelling stories about the struggles and realities of urban life. Lamar's subsequent albums, including To Pimp a Butterfly, 2015, and Damn, 2017 further cemented his status as one of the most influential artists of his generation. His music often addresses themes of racial inequality, police brutality, and social justice, echoing the messages that NWA brought to the forefront of hip-hop. Lamar's ability to blend powerful lyrics with innovative production has earned him numerous awards and accolades, including multiple Grammy Awards. In addition to his musical achievements, Kendrick Lamar has also been recognized for his impact on the culture, DNA, Not Like Us, and his collaboration with Lil Wayne called Mona Lisa are genius and legendary. Not to be left out is his contributions to the community. He has used his platform to advocate for social change and inspire the next generation of artists. Lamar's induction of NWA into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2016 was a testament to the enduring influence of the group on his career in the broader hip-hop landscape. NWA's legacy lives on through artists like Lamar, who continue to push the boundaries of the genre and use their music as a tool for social change. The group's impact on modern hip-hop is a testament to their groundbreaking contributions and the lasting power of their message. Ice Cube's influence on the hip-hop industry transcends his own legendary discography. As a key gatekeeper, Cube has been instrumental in shaping the careers of some of the most prominent figures in rap history. His involvement in the emergence of artists like Dr. Dre, 
Easy e and Snoop Dogg not only catapulted their careers but also played a crucial role in defining the sound and direction of West Coast rap. Cube's connections with influential figures across both music and film have further cemented his position as a central force within the industry, demonstrating his far-reaching impact and visionary leadership. What often gets overshadowed is the essence of Cube's artistry and his role within the genre. While he is frequently associated with gangster rap, Cube never claimed that label for himself. His contributions to hip-hop are better understood as that of a street reporter, an artist who used his platform to relay authentic, gritty narratives about life in Compton and beyond. His music offered a raw, unfiltered perspective on the socio-political realities faced by many, making him a crucial voice in reshaping how rap was perceived and consumed. In celebrating Ice Cube's legacy, we not only acknowledge his significant impact on hip-hop but also his role in breaking down barriers and fostering a new generation of artists. Cube's artistry was never about glorifying violence but about giving a voice to the street and delivering powerful insights through his music. Thank you for joining me in this exploration of Ice Cube's influence and legacy. I'm Quaver TV, and this has been a history lesson in the evolution of hip-hop. Stay tuned for more deep dives and insightful discussions, right here on Quaver Television.